everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Laura Escalante and my colleague Kathleen D'Amico and I are so thrilled to have you here today, along with Sylvia Bosnack. Following our webinar, we will have a short pop-up survey that will appear in your browser, and we're hoping you'll take a moment to let us know your thoughts on today's session. Kathleen? Thanks, Laura. We are thrilled to welcome Sylvia here with us today. Sylvia is a 1979 social sciences grad. She's an accomplished interior design consultant with over 30 years of experience, and she is the principal of Canfield Interiors Incorporated. If you have any questions for Sylvia, we invite you to put them in the Q&A box below. And following Sylvia's presentation, we will get to as many questions as we can. Now, I know that Sylvia has a lot of great information to share with us today. So without any further delay, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Sylvia. Thanks, Kathleen. Just gonna share this screen with everybody. So thanks everyone. First of all, thanks so much, Kathleen, for that very warm introduction. And thank you so much to the McMaster Alumni Association for asking me to do this presentation today on transforming your space. So we have a lot to cover and a lot to talk about, but first of all, I wanna say welcome everyone and welcome my fellow McMaster alumni grads. Thanks for taking the time out of your really busy schedule today to Come and listen to what I have to say about transformation and transforming your space in 2022. There's a lot of material to cover, so we're going to get underway. First of all, as uh, Kathleen and Laura had mentioned, we are going to have questions that will be answered at the end of the presentation because I have so many topics that I want to make sure we cover. And at the end of the presentation, there will be a slide with all my particular information, email, phone, et cetera, in case you wanna get in touch with me. And if those of you who are interested in a console, there'll be the info and how to reach me, et cetera. So I'm happy to answer any of those questions. And we will talk a little bit at the beginning of the Q&A period about how I work, because I think people are interested in that. And there is a number of questions. We were putting up a poll for you, uh, every all the guests to uh, answer, just because I always wanna know what people are thinking, like who have worked with an interior designer or design consultant before? And you, once you answer these, we will just review those steps once we have them in place. So that's the first one, have you worked with an interior designer before? And we're also going to ask how many have, are thinking about doing a renovation in 2022? I know that a lot of people have talked to me about that and thinking of how do they go about that. And so here's the result of the question of, we look at 35% have worked with a designer and 65% have not. So that's interesting to note. The other question was who have worked with, sorry, who, how many of you are thinking about renovating a home or cottage this year? That's Again, a lot of people talking to me about having another space to, to work on and to renovate. So if we uh, if you answer that one, that'll give me a little bit of an idea as to how many people are really thinking about that. Here's the result. We have 70% of people thinking about, no surprise there, renovating a cottage or renovating a home. That's not so, no surprise to me. I think because we haven't been able to travel, we're looking around our places and thinking, boy, this place could use a little bit of help. Anyways, the other one was, what rooms are you thinking about renovating? And uh, whether it's a living room, kitchen, bathroom, bedroom, basement, those are the ones that people are tending to ask me about more than anything is, I need help with this space. It needs to be renovated. And so that's another one that we wanted to get your input on. So I have an idea. I, I do cover a lot of information today, but just thinking about those spaces. So we'll just wait for that poll to come in. So clearly we've got kind of almost, well, the kitchen is 27%, living room, 21%, bathroom, 23%. And people are, 
thinking bedroom is the least important of their space and basement. No surprise there because kind of it's basically just go to sleep in most of the time. So good to note. So let's begin. This is the the, the overview topics that when I put the presentation up for people to sign up that we were going to talk about what are the trends for 2022, whether it's style or design, we're going to get into that. And I don't even really like to word, use the word trends. I like to use influences. We're going to look at inspiration. Where does that come from? Nature's a big inspiration in design today. COVID, how has it affected our lifestyle? How has it affected how we design the construction industry? Can't really think about doing a renovation in 2022 without thinking about what COVID has meant to this industry. And a big focus is small space living and home home offices, really important and just uh, that in general. And of course, do's and don'ts of renovating. If you're going to start a renovating space in 2022, what does that look like? So let's begin with what are the top design trends or influences of 2022? So these are the ones that I've really just headlined. You're going to hear more about these in greater detail as I go through the webinar. So the first one, biophilic design. If you haven't heard about that, you're going to hear a lot of it. Wellness is a huge, huge uh, important factor in our spaces today, how it makes us feel. Staycation, a term that we have become very familiar with in the last two years because we can't travel. Multifunctional spaces is another trend. We're making our spaces do double multiple duty. And of course, the function of the space and technology. These are really when I'm designing a space, this is what the trends are and where we're focusing. So we're going to get start off by the very first one. And I'm really just going to read this little definition and then I'll talk about it in a broader sense. So biophilic design is a concept that the architect and design community have been using and the build community for quite some time now. It's become more mainstream in the last little while. And it's about our connection to nature. And that's the occupant connectivity to nature, be it through direct or indirect. And it gives how that space and place condition, how we do our spaces, how that feels, and the connectivity to the outside world and the nature that inspires us so much. It has been proven to say that it has both health and environment and economic benefits and for the building occupants. And really that is in, in, a, in a nutshell, it's we have to have a connection in our spaces to nature because it makes us feel better. So what are the elements that we wanna incorporate when we are talking about biophilic design? Well, we wanna make sure that we have colors and, and uh, materials in our spaces that mimic nature. And we'll, again, we're gonna give tons of examples of that throughout the presentation. Incorporating plant material, and I'm not talking soap plants, I'm talking the real thing. Water feature. So whether it's something that's a, a tub or a shower, or whether it's even today, we have so many phenomenal home sound systems that can give us a sound of, water or a sound of rain, all of these things that remind us of nature that just make us feel so much better. Plenty of natural light. I can't say that enough. Large windows with a, a view to the outside and big sliding glass doors that open up that make that, bringing that outdoors in and having that seamless transition. Botanical artwork or nature photography or for elements of that kind of feeling of having plant material around or pictures of that, not just for the color, but for the fact of what is it, what is the feeling that it evokes. So this is a pure prime example of what biophilic design is. This is a, a picture from, uh, I've been on many safaris in Africa. This is just one of the bathrooms that I was in, lucky enough to be a part of and stay at this beautiful place. And this bathroom shows all of those elements that I had just talked about. So we've got the 
nature photography, we've got the big soaker tub. There's a glass shower there that is transitional. So there's no lip on that. It's, it's nothing is obstructing the view. There's those elements of the, the uh, wood on the outside and the green and you literally sit in that bathtub and the animals are, are grazing right by from zebras to elephants, you name it. I mean, that's just the most amazing place to be in. I don't know how you cannot be in that space. Now that's the ultimate, but the point being is those are the elements that you want to incorporate. So when I talk about what are the benefits of biophilic design, uh, I mentioned health and wellness. Well, in our bathrooms, we wanna think about home spa. You wanna think about possibly steam showers. Do you have room for a sauna in your house? And when I'm talking about showers, I'm saying rainhead showers, things that make us feel better, things that make, you feel, make us feel calm and relaxed and more importantly, rejuvenated. I don't know, but I put a big soaker tub in my house many years ago. And even though I have a shower with, you know, rainhead, et cetera, there's nothing more rejuvenating than throwing a little, you know, lavender Epsom salts in that bathtub and just relaxing and chilling out at the end of a stressful day. And I think we're all feeling that. So what we found through biophilic design is that it has actually had a, an effect on us psychologically, emotionally, and physiologically. And we have known and seen through this process over the last two years, especially, that when we are calmer and we don't have a big spike in the cortisol, which is the stress hormone in our bodies, and over time, biophilic design has proven to have benefits where it actually reduces our stress hormone and it reduces our blood pressure, which you know tends to go skyrocketing when we're under so much stress with everybody being around. So this whole idea of making sure that our spaces have a wellness component is crucial. And our kitchens, we've also uh, introduced things like having herb gardens and having a garden right outside our back door, great to cook with, much healthier, and having uh, fixtures in our, in our kitchen that are easier and better to cook with that, again, or, or something that actually helps us feel better. And again, we're all cooking together and as a family, it's really important that we have healthier choices. I'm seeing a lot of, in kitchens, eliminating upper cabinetry in places of big windows that are almost at counter height and give us that view to the outside world. Again, I can't uh, stress enough about wellness, as, which is part of the whole biophilic process and design philosophy. When I talk about houseplants, I, I put that in just because, you know, a lot of people aren't saying, I'm, I don't have a green thumb, but there's, it doesn't take a lot. Some of these are not high maintenance and don't need to be watered every day. But more importantly, what is the benefits of houseplants? You know, when we talk about air quality, you know, through the process of photosynthesis, we know and have learned that, you know, it actually absorbs carbon dioxide, the plant material, and it releases oxygen, which is good for air quality. And through this process of transpiration, we actually, it also releases humidity. And especially today in our houses, during the winter, we've got the furnace going. Our, our houses tend to be very, very dry. So I just put up a few little examples. The one on the right-hand side is actually the snake plant, but there are so many plants out there that you can incorporate. So I urge you to, cho to choose real over silk or, uh, you know, something that simulates and, and reach for the real thing if you can. There's another example that I wanted to put up of that ultimate spa experience. That's another shot of the two pictures in that particular African safari bathroom. And the elements there, again, looking to the outside, there was actually an outdoor shower in that bathroom, uh, which is, you can see it in both photos. And the material that was used is concrete, and we've got a double sink, 
but more importantly, the element there is it's really nature inspired. There's nothing really jarring there, very calming, natural, the materials. And I love the fact that it is a seamless transition to outside. So let's we'll talk a little bit about the style trends for 2022. And um, we're gonna talk, look at, and I'll give some great examples of, again, I'm talking about color. Color is nature inspired. We're thinking warm and cozy. And we're thinking about materials that are, again, nature inspired. So I'm talking about natural fibers, cottons, something that has even a little bit of a texture to it. We're thinking about woods, we're thinking about warm woods, and we're thinking teak is, is, a, is something that we're seeing a lot of a resurgence. When we're looking at uh, materials or we're thinking of, uh, I think of a chair that comes to mind, wicker is huge and cane has made a big comeback. And I say, think 70s inspired because, and I wish I didn't throw out half of those beautiful cane chairs that I had, they were so cool in, you know, edged in black with chrome, you know, chrome bases. So when I'm thinking about that styling, that's what I'm talking about. When I talk about a style, there's a combination of styles that are coming together. We're seeing mid-century modern because of its teak influence and very clean lines on it. We're thinking modern rustic. I've got a great example of modern rustic. If you haven't heard these terms, you're gonna see pictures of this. Eclectic style. Eclectic is one of my favorite, but it has to be done properly. Otherwise, it just looks like a big mess. And eclectic is a mixing of styles together. So that's important. And travel inspired. The reason for the travel inspired is because we haven't been able to travel. And so all of these pieces that we've acquired as we've been traveling around the world, we now want them around us. It makes us feel good, but it adds interest. The other big trend or influence, which I have been a huge proponent of for as long as I can remember, is buying Canadian and buying local. Number one, it does the economy good. But the premise of this is we're moving away from this throwing away, throw it away society, buying pieces that last and, being, and buying pieces that, again, support our economy and keep down the, the, you know, the carbon footprint. We're looking at appliances and, and fixtures that are high tech. So appliances that are, and again, high tech, but also smart technology. And space saving is a, is a big factor. We're looking at you know, things like, if I'm doing a kitchen and I don't really use the dishwasher all that much, I don't need a 24 inch wide dishwasher. I can get an 18. They function exactly the same. Or maybe there's a dishwasher drawer that will suffice and that does the trick. And as far as appliances that are doing double duty, if I'm in a condo and I don't need a huge washer and dryer, then there are now washer and dryers combined together. There, there's, there's the amount of technology. I think of a fridge. We can actually now have fridges that have that scan our bar barcode. We put the, the food in it. It, it keeps a record of what we have, this expiry date. Again, no ways. I mean, I could talk for hours just on that alone. The other big, big important factor that I see is style trends is windows. I can't say enough about the importance of, of great windows, about net leading, letting in natural light. And we've seen a lot of the trend has been big black windows. I always say that it really depends on when I'm choosing an exterior for home and I'm picking the brick and I'm picking the roofing and I'm, whatever that I'm picking, it's just like I'm doing in the interior of a home. All of those elements have to work together. And what do I want it to pop? So there's really no right and wrong, but the trend is towards big black windows these days. But it's really about natural light. Nature's inspiration. That's a picture from my one of my many trips, but that is a sea of green. And that's the African horizon with zebra grazing. And I put that up because I believe, like Frank Lloyd Wright, one of the greatest architects used to say, I go to inspiration, I go to nature every day for the day's inspiration and 
how it inspires us as creative people, designers, architects, to be inspired. And to me, that's what I look to, always. Trying to come up with something, what picture can, can I draw inspiration from? And we can do the same. So style trends, let's break it down into colors, cabinetry, I'm gonna talk flooring, and I'm gonna talk surfaces. But the first slide is about color. Benjamin Moore and Sherman William, which is, are my two favorite go-to paint colors. I, that's, I just love both of them. I mean, there are many, but these are my two faves. Benjamin Moore and Sherman Williams, no surprise, have picked green as their color of the year for 2022. And all of the companies that I go to, Caesar Stone, whatever it is, flooring, every single one of these companies are drawing inspiration from nature. That's the trend, that's where we're going. And so it's really easy to put colors and things together because everybody's following the same, the same train or is on the same train. So the two colors that Benjamin Moore and Sherwin William both picked uh, are green. Benjamin Moore's is CC50, October Mist, which is a sage green, lovely color. And Sherwin Williams picked Evergreen Fog, 9130. A little darker, but both great colors to work around. Now, if I'm talking options to put with that, and you'll see that in, um, I've got some slides. I, they've used mustards, they've used terracotta, they've used various shades of brown, not the old, just, you know, basic brown, but hits of color to add some impact. I want you to think warm and earthy. I know I talk about 70s Inspire, but it's the new, inspiration it's not thinking about the old way just the macrame stuff hanging on the wall you know that old 70s style it's really about thinking about being inspired in a new way and when it comes to cabinetry i get this question asked all the time because i'm a kitchen designer what are we where are we seeing cabinetry going well we're going to see the continuation of islands usually done in a, a, in a different color. So whether it's a warm wood and we're gonna see, continue to see painted cabinets. Some of them painted, you know, one of these sage greens. I still see some blue cabinetry that was really popular, but I'm seeing more importantly, you know, whites, but they're warm whites. I'm not seeing a lot of the, the cool grays. That's, that's, we're moving away from that. Okay, so here is just design industry examples. On the left-hand side is the, the Benjamin Moore's CC50, CC550, sorry. And on the right-hand side is Evergreen Fog 9130. And you can see in that picture on the right-hand side that, that they did the cabinetry in that particular green, really warm and uh, more of a traditional look to it. But the cabinetry for the most part isn't fussy. I still see a lot of uh, flatter panel doors, not you know overly ornate. It's keeping it simple. It's keeping it uncluttered. It's just you know letting the space. I say be. Now these are there's an example of I'm using Benjamin Moore because I kind of go to that more than anything. But on the left hand side is a picture of the October mess that I just talked about, the color of the year put with lilac and that lilac color, it's so refreshing and so pretty. They use that in a bedroom. And then on the right-hand side, we're talking about that pop of color and that's the wildflower, kind of that terracotta color. And we've, in that particular bathroom, we've, you know, accented it with the black. There's the, you know, that transitional shower I talked about. There's the plant material. There's the multiple hedge, you know, options for, a rain head shower or a handheld with a bigger head on it. But that's a fun bathroom. And there's a little bit of the wood. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. But it's not boring, it's fun. Two other really great colors by Benjamin Moore. All again, you can pick up their color chart and they're all in there. On the left-hand side is another option for green, which is Fernwood Green. And that particular green has a lot of yellow in it. Very sunny, very light and bright. Looks great with hits of color. Looks great with that wood kind of teak looking color that I'm talking about and the white. And on the right-hand side, Pale Moon, OC 108. 
pale moon, which is a yellow. And you know, when I look at that picture, it's it's put together with mustard and it looks so amazing. Mustard is one of my favorite, favorite colors to design around because it goes with everything. And when I talk about color, I talk about how color affects us. You know, is it any wonder that my office is done in green? Well, the reason why it's done in green is because green evokes creativity. And yellow gives us positive feedback. It makes us feel um, hopeful. And, and I think there's a lot of people that are using yellow in their spaces now because they want to get up and feel in a space that's cheery and positive. Red always gives us a sense and that terracotta is about energy and energizing the space. So think about the color. I mean, I could do a whole webinar just on color because color is influenced by the light that that room is receiving. So no matter what place you put color in that particular room, whatever wall you put it on, it's always gonna appear differently because at different times of day because of the amount of light that room receives. The kitchen that I put up here is a kitchen that I did for a client and the, that's not a big kitchen, but what I wanted to emphasize here was the, the client was really already big into nature. That's their nature photography on the wall in the left-hand side. And it was about having the connection to the outside of the backyard. But we've got the big thing about this kitchen is we've got two uh, spaces where they can work from. We've got an island, a custom island. That's a big popular thing in kitchens today because we had two cooks. We had two sinks. We have touchless faucets. We have hardwood on the floor. We have, you know, the more drawers than we do doors. One of my biggest things is if you have these drawers, and make sure that they are organized properly inside. That's one of the biggest things with, with kitchens. I design, I mean, I, I do a lot of design and I try to put in as, as many drawers and rollouts and have them in the insides really well organized with, you know, sp space saving. So we're elements so that we're not using and wasting that drawer and it just becomes a big mess of clutter inside it. So. Organizing it properly is crucial and having great lighting. We've got great natural lighting. And again, we've got green on the wall. So that, uh, and we've, on that particular kitchen, we have granite, the client loved granite. I'm, I've moved away from using granite. I haven't used granite. Uh, it's not my go-to. Quartz is, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but that was just really about, you know, the feeling of the bringing the outdoors in. Okay, what are we seeing in flooring today? Well, hardwood has made such leaps and bounds. We are seeing, I'm seeing more maple, uh, sorry, more oak wood flooring work with a lot of grain. We're using oak floors that are wide widths, seven, eight inches is what I'm, I'm using more than anything. And we're using flooring for the most part that are lighter in colors. Uh, we've moved towards that, but I always say, you know, do what you love. If you have a house that you want a little richer on the floor, you know, you can do that. But we're finding the trend is moving to lighter flooring. And, you know, the engineered hardwood is what we've seen. I mean, there's a lot of great makes out there that are Canadian made. Again, I go to Canadian made hardwood companies. Mercier is one of them in Quebec. There's so many, but buy Canadian when you can. That just the way they're made, it's just, they cost a little more, but they're worth every single penny. And the other part that we're seeing, if we're not using engineered hardwood, we're using a product called LVT. And LVT is, stands for Luxury Vinyl Tile. I've been using those for probably over 10 years now, and they simulate wood. They hold up, they're fabulous in high traffic areas. They're fabulous in basements. They literally, you can glue them down, but there's so many types, there's click. But again, things that simulate wood that are hard wearing and durable. You got pets, beautiful way to go. And so again, we're seeing this textured feeling. Surfaces, when I'm talking about surface, I'm talking countertops. And I go to the engineered, basically we're quartz, which is a man-made and engineered product 
And where are they going with that? Well, name brands like Silestone, Caesar Stone, Cambria, all taking their leads from, again, the nature's inspiration. So things that mimic the sky, some things that mimic uh, the sand. And we're going to be using more honed, which is the unpolished shiny surfaces. Why is that? Because it simulates, looks more natural, looks more real. And that's where we're going with, with the surfaces. There's an example. So the top right-hand corner of that picture there is actually an LVT, a luxury vinyl tile, in a, I believe it's six inches or seven inches wide, they come 48 inches long. And they really, when you touch them, they really look like wood. I mean, I did them, I'll show you a, a picture that I have that I use in a client's uh, cottage reno. And every architect who came by to look at it was on the, you know, bent down saying that this looks like great hardwood and they said, oh, wait a second, is this LVT? Yeah. So that's where we're going. And the two pictures there in the slides of uh, that style stone, which is the quartz, which like I said, mimic stone, mimic the, the product there, mimics hardwood. But it's really about that that's the style stone, again, mimicking sand, mimicking rock, but hard, hard wearing surfaces. And again, look at the colors. Sand, think earth. So having all of that in mind, let's talk about the fact of COVID. I can't believe I'm still talking about this, but it is what it is. And it's been two years in the making and it has had a huge effect on all of us, not just on our health, but on our, our mental well-being. But more importantly, it's had a huge effect on the build and construction and design industry. So when I say about we have now had a craving to have a connection to nature more than ever, that's because we have been confined so much to our houses. And I talked about earlier about the impact on us physiologically, psychologically, and emotionally. What that's done is it has really driven the outdoor kitchen design. It has driven us to having our backyard, this staycation, which is the need that we couldn't travel. So we better create something in our own backyard that makes us feel like we're on vacation. So it's more than just the pool. It's about putting a space, you know, opening up a, 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 maybe a wall that we had just a basic window on, putting in a glass slider, and now being outside in a space where it's more than just the barbecue. It's outdoor refrigeration. And I'm going to show you a couple of pictures. I love a company called DCS. Uh, and Fisher Paykel because they do amazing appliances, outdoor appliances. And so when we look at that, we say, you know what, I can create an outdoor kitchen that's as good as or the equivalent of my indoor kitchen. But this transition back and forth, we need to have this space as work as one. And then you've got your herb garden or vegetable garden. And it's about creating a great place to entertain. And so we also saw not only renovating our, our backyard, we saw the upswing of renovating our kitchens and bathrooms. That was the trend because now we needed to have, as I mentioned earlier, those spaces that make us feel better and function better. And especially since we were all working together in their house. You know, one good part about COVID is I'm a huge cook and I'm so happy to see that people were starling, starting to finally cook together and going back to cooking and having fun with it. If you weren't a great cook, you're sure going to be now because you spent two years practicing. And so, you know, instead of having that speed dial of ordering out, anybody who knows me hates, but no, I hate ordering out. I'd rather cook any day of the week, but I want to, I have fun with it. And then the other move was again, the move away from the concrete jungle. Yes, there are people who are still in condos, but what I saw more than anything was that people were now craving some space. So there, you know, there was, this move away to have an outdoor space, have a bit more of a garden. And even we saw a big push towards cottage country. I also have a lot of clients and friends of mine who had bought little places. One client who were in Toronto, they retired from what they were doing, kept a little wee apartment in, in TO. They had a cottage up north that I helped them renovate. And actually, we, they eventually knocked it down and built a beautiful cottage. 
and now they're there full time. But they had this long range plan that that's where they wanted to retire. We're seeing a lot of that now. And I, we're seeing younger people more than ever buying properties in rural areas. And, and because, you know, they just have this craving. They need space for their family to run around and not be on top of each other. So when I talk about cottage renovation, this is just one of the ones that I've done. This is a picture of a 1970s, early 70s or late 60s cottage that was built. We didn't have the opportunity to tear it down. The client wanted to, to keep it. It's not winterized. It's only 876, no, 867 square feet. Tiny little thing. But it was all about the view uh, to the lake. And this is on Lake Rosso. And that's the ugliest you know, when I think 70s inspired, you know, I look at that, I want to be sick. But anyways, there's a picture of what we did with it, or my team did with it. And we painted all the, the, the uh, paneling, quite a process. We put the LVT on the floor. We, I put in a great big sectional. I updated the lighting. But the, the most important thing was that we made that space functional. And we really incorporated all the things that I've talked about, the mustard, the photography, nature photography. That's a local artist from a photographer from the Port Carling area, does amazing pieces. And it was really about taking something that I wasn't, a, I, we couldn't tear down, but that we could, you know, renovate or give it a facelift. And I did that back in 2012. And that, it's 10 years ago, and it still looks amazing. They still haven't torn it down. I don't think they're ever going to tear it down. But anyways, if you want to see more of that, I have a, a YouTube channel, and I have pictures of the before and after on my house profile. So I also did this client's boathouse from scratch, and I was responsible for every single aspect of it, from the initial design sketch to picking every single aspect, hiring the builder. It I started that in 2012 as well, which was an eight-year build. And the inspiration came from this picture, this slide, my favorite animal, the zebra. Um, fascinating animal. And that's the inspiration. That's the boathouse. So that's what I call um, just, that's a really modern, sorry, not a modern structure. That is, you know, the, the earlier I was talking about having modern rustic. So that's a combination of modern with the rustic. The rustic elements, meaning that the outside of that is not wood. That's actually another product that simulates wood, but is not. And that is blending those two styles together, outlined in that black, which is again, that inspiration from the zebra and its colors, but more about mimicking what is surrounding in nature, you know, the rocks, the trees, and having it blend in. I judge a lot of architecture competitions for the Ontario Home Builders Association. And one of my biggest pet peeves is when the architecture does not follow the lay of the land. It drives me insane. Nothing bugs me more when I see this big metal structure just plop down and it, and it literally doesn't connect to anything. So that's where the biophilic is, is not about. So this is biophilic design personified. And that whole side, those are seven feet high by, I believe, nine feet wide sliding glass doors that I sourced from uh, a company there are actually made in Greece. There's the picture of the before on the left-hand side, and there's the picture of it on the right-hand side, now a two-day structure, glass. And again, you know, not all of us have the option to have this, but it's about having a fabulous space outside that you connect to, no matter what that size is. The interior, I'm going to just reiterate what the elements are, and that is that we've got, you know, elements of nature. We've got the big part about that from the technology side, that is outdoor cabinetry that sustain the elements. That cottage, sorry, that boathouse is not winterized. Those appliances are made by DCS. Those are stainless steel and they can have snow piled on them. That we've got a fridge there and a, a ice maker, fabulous. We've got quartz on the countertop, again, that mimic nature. Um, we have cabinetry that actually is a, we did ceiling to floor there, making sure that we use the storage. And we have 
them in that driftwood color that again simulates nature. You know, you're so tired of hearing me say this. And the windows, which are really the star. And again, that was chosen in that particular element of that driftwood color. But that to me acts as the artwork in the space. And I can't do any space without having fabulous lighting. Why not have a chandelier? Why not have, you know, the ultimate in, in light? We always on dimmers. Again, I could do a whole webinar just on lighting because it's so, so important. But it's really about, you know, we do a lot of planning and we do, I do a lot of questions with my clients. And I do have this holistic approach to design. We'll get into it later, which looks at all aspects of someone's life. How do they work? How do they live? You know, what do they need? I ask too many questions, but I have a reason for asking them. And it's usually to get the best possible results for my clients. That's a fabulous space. That's just a quick picture of the outside showing that that's the outdoor cabinetry. And on the, on the left-hand side is, again, that's not actual wicker or rattan, but that actually simulates it, great quality and a great place to lounge. So I treat my outdoor spaces just like I would my indoor. What, how much accommodation do I need? Do I need a dining table? Again, you got to plan it, plan it, plan it. Small space living. This is a condo that I did for a client and I'm just going to fast forward to the next slide, which talks about the elements of small space living. We've got here the elements where we want to make sure that the color is continued throughout. We've used a lot of glass because visually it's not there. We've used reflective values, which are the mirrors. And we created you know, the television on the wall because it, again, didn't take up space. In this particular slide, I use a lot of mirrors to bounce light back into the space, ceiling to floor cabinetry, a dining table that actually doubles as the client's um, workspace and, and desk, but then can be pulled out when he needs to entertain and swivel chairs there that also are adjustable. I love anything that swivels because you can easily have in people being a part of that area when they need to be. When it comes to small spaces, whether it's your home office, I can't say enough about, you know, people talk about a Murphy bed or a sofa bed. I would take a sofa bed. I like to be able to have that uh, option in this particular space. Again, we have the glass. But then I've gone on the left-hand side, I've got storage there for the client that they can put, you know, television, books. If they want to work in that space, they can. They can put that little table off to the side over. It's about having spaces that do double duty. And that table is actually a condo size. So it's not that big, but it has storage underneath. And the bedding is all stored for that room when the client, that was their second bedroom, but we decided to use it as again, dust bedroom. And that's, that sofa bed is a queen size bed. So houses a lot of, 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 of uh, you know, options. So when I talk about creating a home office, I've talked about some of, the, some of the options. And that is, first of all, always think about how you work and how much space you need. I, as an interior designer, need a lot of space. I've got a lot of material. I need to spread out blueprints, et cetera. Don't forget to use the space vertically. Make sure that you're incorporating, you know, you've got space above it. Don't put everything on the floor. Put shelves, put, put storage unit, put your things away. And think about an office where you can have a door to it so you buffer the sound. If you're building a new space, put in a pocket door if you don't have a, a, a door that you can put on it that maybe eats up space or a barn door. But having a door is really important and always incorporate great prop product, uh, sorry, task lighting and overhead lighting because you have to see what you're working on. And as far as um, having, sorry, I'm just going to go to that. And, and a must fit is a great chair, a great task chair that you're going to sit at that you're comfortable in. And especially now with us working from home, that's crucial. This particular picture is a client's, again, that was the second bedroom, but we used a sofa uh, bed with a chaise. So that client can easily lounge on that if they're going to have reading material or they, when their client comes into or their friend comes into town 
get a place for them to stay. That again is a queen bed. Again, there's the storage. I love that color on the wall. There's a really rich uh, Benjamin Moore color area carpet to anchor the space. Really important. Now, again, that little picture on the left is the other end of that room. They don't want, they didn't want any drawers or storage in their, uh, in their desk. They just are a computer person, they need IT person. They don't, this is actually a millennial client of mine who everything is in the cloud. And I think it's, it's us as a, 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 a Zoomer or a Boomer that I still have more paper hanging around than I should. That's my office on the right. Again, this is where I'm broadcasting from today. I've got the window to look out onto the garden and I have plenty of storage with a glass leaded door to buffer any sound. Great lighting though throughout. Let's, go, let's review do's and don'ts of renovating because I'm just keeping an eye on the time. I'm just gonna run through these because I could, again, it's just crazy how many things, the pitfalls that to avoid. First of all, think of always hiring experienced professionals, designers, architects, and tradespeople who are licensed. They are worth their weight in gold. I can't say that enough. And hire, if you can, someone who is experienced, who knows the pitfalls. Check their references. I mean, it's easy to check references today on whether it's Google or House or LinkedIn. Check their references or call people and go and visit their work. Not maybe so easier to do today because with COVID, we can always get in. Plan is crucial, having a plan. Think about the function of what, you, what you're doing. How's the space gonna function? I think about function over pretty. Function is crucial. I always ask my clients to prepare a wish list. I try to hit every single one of those items on their wish list, no matter regardless of the size of the space. Crucial. I help my clients prepare a budget and, and being realistic about the budget. You know, I kind of liken it to if I was buying a car, I'd be thinking about what lot am I going to? I'm going to buy the Porsche. Am I going to buy the Honda that's going to get me from point A to point B? First of all, don't rush. Rushing equals mistakes, which equals dollars lost. Consider COVID. Everything in COVID today, since COVID hit, we have, we're taking months to get furniture. We're getting, taking months to get appliances. We're taking a month to get a repair piece. I mean, just for a bathroom reno. So it's, it, if I'm thinking about planning, a, uh, doing a renovation in my house, you know, this year, start now, the sooner the better. And don't expect that you're going to get your tradespeople in by next week, because the people who are busy, uh, who are good, are busy. And then obviously always obtain building permits. You know, I can't say that enough. And especially if you're hiring professionals, they're going to make sure that you're getting the necessary building permits. And the kitchen reno in this particular a slide, that's one of that I did. We couldn't take the low, this whole wall out, low bearing wall, but the point of this was not a big kitchen, opening up the view to the backyard, doing a new slider, increasing the size of the window, adding in great lighting. There's the quartz that I talk about on the, on the countertop, a feeling of calm. There's the final picture with having great lighting and having a view and access to the backyard. And if I can say anything, what adds value, people ask me all the time. Definitely kitchens and bathrooms that function and are up to date, whether it's from a low flush toilet to uh, one that's ergonomically, you know, that, that sit a little higher. Finish your basements if you have the opportunity because, you know, from selling your houses, those are one of the things people love having a, a finished basement, even if you've got a bungalow. Storage and cabinetry, custom cabinetry is huge. Mud rooms, can't say enough about that. I put a mud room in my house 35 years ago. Best thing I ever did. Home gyms because of wellness and you know new windows. But the most important thing is about clearing clutter and, and making sure that you edit. This is a picture of a custom cabinetry that I did for a client. Again, view to the outside, that's their backyard. Warm colors, a little bit of texture, pops of color with the orangey terracotta. And it just is a great space to live around. Another example of custom cabinetry, this particular one, we've got the television hidden away because we've got pocket doors. But again, this seamlessness 
and organizing, you know, that's all custom cabinetry. That's a Canadian made company that I was a dealer for for 10 years. So that uh, is just money well spent. That's my own home gym. And what I can say about having a home gym, having a place to, you know, exercise during COVID is it's so important during the wellness phase of what we, we need for ourselves. And if I'm doing a home gym, it's just like doing any other space. Make sure that you know the size of the equipment that you need and incorporate that in. So get your measurements ahead of time. Now that's a, a, a treadmill uh, that's important to create that takes a lot of space, but still even if it's having a mat and having a place where you can do a bit of yoga or a place where you can just retreat, we need somewhere in our house where we can go and do that. It just helps us. So really what's, the, as a recap, what's in and what's out, we talked about biophilic design and a connection to nature right off the top. Paint colors that mimic nature, so sage greens, terracottas, mustards, browns. I had written down a great brown. This is actually uh, one by Sherwin-Williams. It's called, uh, it's SW0045, SW0045. You can check that out. Um, and another cool one by Sherwin Williams was uh, a wicker color. It's actually called wicker. It's SW9104. I mean, there are others, but those are just a couple of examples. Wellness, harped on this one, calming spaces, home gyms, natural materials and natural fabrics, oak floors, as opposed to maple, because there's a lot of grain, multifunctional spaces, and technology, smart technology. That's what's in. That's what's, what's where we need to be thinking about regardless of what your space is or how big it is. And while, what's out, sorry about that, all white kitchens, spaces that are really sterile looking, the all gray space. If you're going to do a gray, it's got to be a really warm gray. And again, open concept living. You know, I've, I've, the days of ripping out all the walls and you're getting this echo, people really realized that they needed a private space. I was never a big fan of ripping out all the walls and having open concept because I just thought it didn't, it didn't make sense to me. Anyways, there's the uh, slide. We've got about five minutes left where we can take some questions, but that's my contact information for anyone who's looking to get in touch with me. You can check out my YouTube, my house, um, um, pretty much Instagram. I, I'm, I'm you can find me somewhere and somehow, let's put it that way. So I think Kathleen, we're gonna answer a few questions. So I'm just gonna stop sharing my slide here. That is uh, such great information, Sylvia. I think thanks. we could be here all afternoon just listening yeah. to all of thanks. this. I was just trying, I know there was a lot of material to cover and if I talk too fast, my apologies, but I'm just trying to get it all in. You know, it's I do entire great. slides about the whole process. So what have we got as far as questions? So we have a few questions. So first question is, uh, do you do consultations and how can I reach you? So yes, absolutely. I do consultations and uh, I'm located on the Stony Creek Mountain, but I do travel. You know, I have clients all over the place from Muskoka to Niagara on the Lake. So you can just email me or, you know, shoot me an email and ask me. And, you know, my process, as I mentioned just quickly, and people will read, is that I have a really, I have a holistic approach to design, which I said, I look at everything about the aspect of how people work. And maybe this is because I started flipping houses when I was 17. So I've learned a few things along the way. That's the only good thing about getting old, right? So experience. This is a business that the older you get, the better you get. So what else can I address? Awesome. Uh, so here's a great question. And there are so many. I know we won't get to all of them. But are there any trends or styles that you see that keep coming back into the industry? Um, I still think that, you know, eclectic, an eclectic style is something because the more we move around and the more we we you know, have a, a conglomeration of people moving together, you know, people getting together, you know, you got his style, her style, and actually eclectic is a mixing of styles. 
important to do properly, but I would say eclectic has made its way back. Never really went out of style, but wasn't always the most popular, but we're seeing that more than anything now. Great, great. And I know you talked a little bit about the home office space uh, earlier. We have had quite a few uh, queries come in about that. Um, but here is an interesting one. So for a home office, uh, should there be a library behind you for camera meetings or should uh, you stick with a plain background? So, it, it, so if you're doing a lot of Zoom calls, one of the most important things is not to have a background that is really, really busy um, because or cluttered because people are going to be focusing on what's behind you as opposed to you, right? The eyes want to be on you, not your background. Um, so it's about keeping it uncluttered. And I, and I see so many professionals, I mean, especially in the news media today, where the background is so busy and it's just such a mess. And I'm like, the first thing I want to do is go clear the clutter, man, <laughs> clear the color. So that's kind of my thing, you know, and, and have, so, you know, and, and it depends, you know, Zoom is, is a whole entity into itself, but just try to make sure that it's not super busy. Good lighting. Good advice. Uh we have another question, a kitchen question. Are white cabinets in the kitchen timeless, regardless of the trends? Uh, will they ever become quickly outdated? No, my, white will always be a mainstay. It is still, when I didn't have my dealership, it is still the number one seller. It's about a big thing I think that dates it is door styles. And I think this, the white in combination you know, with something. I typically do an island that is, you know, a, a darker color. I have a number of those that I've done. I, I think it really depends on the size of the space. I tend to do white a lot. It's my go-to, but I, co I combine it with other things, with other colors. And again, it's the size of the space and how much light that room gets. There's so many factors, but white in, in a nutshell, I don't think it will ever go out of style. Great, thanks. Uh, oh, so many questions here. Uh, how do you incorporate darker, warmer colors like greens, browns, and smaller spaces without making the space feel closed in? Okay, so one of the most important things is the the, the light that the cup, that room gets. So let me just stay off the top. If you have a north facing room, you're not going to get a lot of light. It's a constant all the time. If you have a south facing room, you're gonna get a lot of sunlight and an east facing is the best because it gets the most sunlight. So I look at where the room faces, I look at how I'm gonna use that room, how is it gonna be used? And a lot of times I will use mirrors to bring more light into that space. So tricking the light, having it bounce off, that's like the best design trick that people have is having mirrors uh, and, and when you're using mirrors, be careful of how you use them, because if you're really messy, you're going to see double the mess, you know, and don't put a mirror on your above your fireplace. So the only thing that you see is the ceiling. So, but having, it's okay to have a dark color in a room if you want it to feel cozy, right? And then you can lighten it up with a lighter couch and add it some color of an impact. You know, it has that that picture that I showed where we had a darker picture on the darker color on the wall and that's darker floor. That client had come from a house that was really light and he goes, I'm tired of this. I want warmth. I'm craving having this cozy feeling like caramel. That's it. But that room gets a lot of light. Right. That's the key. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I can't believe that we're we're at two o'clock already, Sylvia, and so much uh, activity in the chat, so many questions. So maybe we're going to have to do a part two to this. I think so. I think we should do a part two just on color. I, <laughs> that would be thing, good. That yeah, would be. Because, because this is the thing that I think people just have such a hard time with, and it is the cheapest way to renovate and to make to feel better about your space. A can of paint. I always say to clients, it's a can of paint, right? It's a can of paint. And most people can, you know, aren't bad at painting. The prep is everything, but maybe if we did that and painting cabinetry is a big thing that I also do. So uh, I think we should do a part two. 
I think we're definitely going to have to do a part two. So thank you so much, Sylvia, for your time. And thank you to all of our viewers today for taking time out of your schedule to join us. I'll remind you that there'll be a survey popping up at the conclusion of this webinar. So we hope that you will take a few moments to fill that out. And I hope everybody has a great remainder of the day and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks Thank again. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Kathleen. Bye.